Section one of Buff a Collie and Other Dog Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Buff a Collie and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Buff a Collie The Fighting Strain, Part One. She was a mixture of the unmixable. Not one expert in eighty could have guessed at her breed or breeds. Her coat was like a chow's, except that it was black and white and tan, as is no chow's between here and the Chinese wall. Her deep chest was as wide as a bulldog's. Her queer little eyes slanted like a collie's. Her foreface was like a Great Dane's, with its barrel muzzle and dewlaps. She was as big as a mastiff. She was Nina, and she belonged to a well-to-do farmer named Shaw, a man who went in for registered cattle and, as a sideline, for prize collies. To clear up, in a handful of words, the mystery of Nina's breeding, her dam was Shaw's long pedigreed and registered and prize-winning tricolour collie, Shaw Mere Queen. Her sire was Upstreet Butcher Boy, the fiercest and gamest and strongest and most murderous pit terrier ever loosed upon a doomed opponent. Shaw had decided not to breed Shawmere Queen that season. Shawmere Queen had decided differently. Wherefore she had broken from her enclosure by the simple method of gnawing for three hours at the rotting wood that held a rusty lock staple. This had chanced to befall on a night when Tug McManus had deputed the evening exercise of Upstreet Butcher Boy to a new handyman. The handyman did not know Butcher Boy's odd trick of going slack in the chain for a moment and then flinging himself forward with all his surpassing speed and still more surpassing strength. As a result, the man came back to McManus's alone, noisily nursing three chain-torn fingers. Butcher Boy trotted home to his kennel at dawn, stolidly taking the wailing which McManus saw fit to administer. When Shawmere Queen's six bullet-headed pups came into the world, sixty-three days later, there was a loud and lurid blasphemy at her master's kennels. Shaw, as soon as he could speak with any degree of coherence, bade his kennelman drown five of the pups at once, and give like treatment to the sick as soon as its mother should have no further need of the youngster. At random, the kennelman scooped up five-sixths of the litter, and strolled off to the horse-pond. As a result of this monopoly, the sixth puppy throve apace. When she was eight weeks old, fate intervened once more to save her from the horse-pond. Mrs. Shaw's sister had come, with her two children, to spend the summer at the farm. The children, after a glimpse of the pure-breed collie litters gambling in the shaded puppy run, had clamoured loudly for a pup of their own to play with. Shaw knew the ways of a child with a puppy. He was of no mind to risk chorea, or rickets, or fits, or other ailments for any of his priceless collie babies, for such teddy bear handling as the two youngsters would probably give. Yet the clamour of the pair grew the more plagiantly insistent. Then it was that the bothered man bethought him of the illegitimate offspring of Shawmere Queen, the nondescript pup he had planned to drown within the next few days. The problem was solved. Once more peace reigned at Shawmere, and the two children were deliriously happy in the possession of a shaggy and shapeless morsel of puppyhood, in whose veins coursed the ancient royal blood of pure colliedom and the riotously battling strain of the pit warriors. They named their pet Nina, after a Pomeranian they had mauled and harassed into convulsions, and they prepared to give like treatment to their present puppy. But a crossbreed is ever prone to be super sturdy. The roughly affectionate manhandling which had torn the pom's hair-trigger nerves and tenuous vitality to shreds had no effect at all upon Nina. On the contrary, she waxed fat under the dual caresses and yankings of her new owners. Which was lucky, for while a puppy is an ideal playmate for a child, the average child is a horrible playmate for a puppy. With no consciousness of cruelty, 
children maul or neglect or otherwise ill-treat thousands of friendly and helpless puppies to death every year and fond parents look on with fatuous smiles at their playful offspring's barbarity strong and vigorous from birth nina began to take on size at an amazing rate before she was eight months old she stood higher at the shoulder than any collie at shawmere she looked like no other dog on earth and she was larger by far than either of her parents the cleverest breeder cannot always breed his best stock true to type and when it comes to cross-breeding especially with dogs nothing short of mother nature herself can predict the outcome nina was a freak she resembled outwardly neither collie nor pit bull terrier withal she was not ill to look on there was a compact symmetry and an impression of latent power to her and the nondescript coat was thick and fine in spite of all this she probably would have met with a swift and reasonably merciful death on the departure of the two children that autumn had not shaw realized that the youngsters had been invited to the farm for the following summer and that the presence of their adored nina would save some thoroughbred pup from sacrifice as a pet so the crossbreed was permitted to stay on living at shawmere on sufferance well enough fed and housed in the stables permitted to wander pretty much at will but unpetted and unnoticed the folk at the farm believed in breeding true to form a nondescript did not interest them and the loss was theirs for the gigantic young mongrel was worth cultivating clever lovable obedient brave she was an ideal farm dog and wistfully she sought to win friends from among these indifferent humans sadly she missed the petting and the mauling of the children these so-called mongrels by the way are prone to be cleverer and stronger than any thoroughbred rightly trained they are ideal chums and pets and guards a truth too little known if the farm people had troubled to give nina one fiftieth of the attention they lavished on the kennel dogs they would have seen to it that she did not set forth one icy moonlight night in late november on a restless gallop over the hills beyond the farm and this story would not have been written champion shawmere king was one of the four greatest collies in america perhaps on earth he was such a dog as is bred perhaps twice in a generation flawless in show qualities and in beauty and in mind he had annexed the needful fifteen points for his championship at the first six shows to which shaw had taken him everywhere he had swept his way to winners with ridiculous ease he was the sensation of every show he went to wisely shaw had withdrawn him from the ring while king was still in his glory and a few years later the champion had been taken permanently from the kennels and had been promoted or retired to the rank of chief house dog as perfect in the home as in the ring he was the pride and ornament of the big farmhouse on this particular november night of ice and moonlight king had turned his back on the warmth of the living room fire and the disreputable old fur rug that was his resting place and had stretched himself upon the veranda mat head between forepaws his deep-set dark eyes fixed on the high road leading from town shaw had gone to town for the evening he had forbidden king to go with him but collie like the champion had preferred waiting in the cold porch for a glimpse of his returning master rather than lie in smug comfort indoors as he lay there he lifted his head suddenly from between his white forepaws and sniffed the dead cold air at the same moment the patter of running feet on the icy ground caught his ear scent and sound came from the direction of the distant stables then athwart his gaze loomed something big and bulky that flashed in the white moonlight cantering past him with an inviting backward lilt of the head as it made for the hills at once on the invitation king forgot his accruing years and his dignity with a bound he was at nina's side together the two raced madly across the yard and across the yellow road and on up into the hills it was a wonderful night for such a wild run pure breed and cross breed were obsessed by the urge of it all forgotten was king's stolidly loyal intent 
to lie on the chilly mat until Shaw should return. Forgotten was the wistful loneliness that had saddened Nina since the departure of the two children. As the dogs bounded across the bright road, the kennel man, returning from a stroll, caught sight of them and recognized them. He shouted to King to come to heel. The champion did not so much as look back. At Shaw's call he would have obeyed, though with vast reluctance. But this man was a hireling, and no dog knows better than a collie the wide difference in the loyal obedience due to a master and the negligible civility due to an employee. So King kept on at the shoulder of his galloping new mate. When Shaw, late in January, followed the kennelman to the corner of the disused stall and stared down at Nina, his face was creased in a frown of disgust. There, deep in a pile of bedding, lay the big, young, crossbred dog. She looked up at the visitors with a welcoming glint of her round brown eyes and a thumping wag of her bushy tail. She was happy at their notice. She was inordinately proud of what they had come to see. Snuggled close against her side squirmed seven puppies. They were three days old. A more motley collection could not have been found in Dogdom. Two were short-haired and bullet-headed, and were white except for a brindle spot or two on head and hip. Throwbacks, these, to their warlike grandsire, Upstreet Butcher Boy. Three more were intermediate of aspect, and might or might not be going to have long coats. A sixth was enough like a thoroughbred collie to have passed muster in almost any newborn collie litter. Over this harlequin sextet, Shaw's contemptuous glance strayed. Then his gaze focused on the seventh pup, and the frown was merged into a look of blank incredulity. The pup was lying an inch or two away from his dam, and several inches from the huddle of brothers and sisters. Every line of him was clearly visible and distinct from the rest. To a layman, he looked like a three-day-old collie. To sure, he did not. Any collie expert will tell you that at the age of three days, a pup gives far truer promise of his future appearance to the trained eye than he gives at three months. To the man who knows there is a look, to the head especially, that foreshadows the lines of maturity. Later, all this foreshadowing vanishes. At two or three months, it is next to impossible to predict what the pup is going to turn into. But at that one brief phase of babyhood, the future often is writ clear. Shaw noticed the coffin-shaped skull, the square muzzle, the full foreface, the set of the tiny ears, the general confirmation. Unbelieving, he stared. He picked up the wiggling morsel of fur and flesh, and looked more closely at those prophetic headlines. Good Lord, he mumbled, bewildered. Why, why, that's a... A dog! He's a living image of what King was at three days, and I picked out King for a great collie when he was this youngster's age. I've never known it to fail, never up to now. What's this measly mongrel doing? with the head and build of a winner. Well, ruminated the kennelman, we know he's three-quarter bred, don't we? King's his sire, and Shawmere Queen was his dam's mother. Best blood anywhere in Collydom, ain't it? And it had to come out somewheres, didn't it? Crossbreeding ain't like mixing feed. You don't get the same mixture every measureful you dip out. Some is all one kind, and some is all another, and some ain't neither. Look at them two white fellows. They're straight bullpup, wherever they got it. Not a trace of collie to em. It's got to be averaged up somewheres, and it's averaged up in that little cast you're holding there. He's a collie, just like the two whitish ones is all bull. It's... I've... I've heard of such cases, muttered Shaw, wonderingly, as he laid the tiny pup back at the mother's side. But, oh, he'll most likely develop a body that'll give him away or else the head won't live up to its promise. Well, leave him anyhow when you drown the rest. That can't do any harm. Sheepishly, he gave the order. Still more sheepishly, as he left the stall, he stooped and patted Nina's loving, upraised head, the first caress he had ever wasted on the lonely crossbreed. Thus it was that a great dog was born, 
and that his promise of greatness was discovered barely in time to save him from death in earliest babyhood for the collie or near collie pup was destined to greatness both of body and of brain shaw named him buff this of course without the honorary prefix of the kennel name shawmere for buff could never be registered his spotty pedigree could never be certified he could claim no line in the american kennel club stud book he was without recognized lineage without the right to wear a number after his name a dog to be registered must come of registered parents these parents in turn must come of registered stock since no dog ordinarily is eligible to registration unless both his sire and dam have been registered that means his race must have been pure and his blood of unmingled azure since the beginning of his breed's recognition by the stud books buff sire could have traced his genealogy back in an unbroken line for centuries king's nearer ancestors had been the peerless noblemen of dogdom nina's sire and dam though of widely different stock were born to the purple despite all this their descendant was a mongrel and barred by kennel law from any bench show the nameless pup grew to beautiful doghood to all outward appearance he was a pure-bred collie of the very highest type the head was classic in its perfection the body had the long wolf-like lines of the true collie the coat was a marvel the chest was deep and broad the body powerfully graceful no collie judge unhung could have detected the bar sinister the mind and the soul and the heart too were of the true collie sort but blended with the fiery gaiety and dash of his predominant breed ran unseen the steadfastness the calm the grimness the stark warrior spirit of the pitbull terrier this same strain ran equally unseen through the physique as well giving uncollie like staunchness and iron strength and endurance to the graceful frame imparting an added depth of chest a gripping and rending quality to the jaw muscles a mystic battling genius to body and to spirit yes old upstreet butcher boy was present in this collie grandson of his so were a hundred mighty bull terrier ancestors it was a strange blend yet it was a blend not a mixture nature for once had been kind and had sought to atone for the cruel joke she had played in the making of poor neglected nina the first half year or more of buff's life passed pleasantly enough at shawmere at the age of three months he was moved from the stables and put in one of the puppy runs nina was miserable at her baby's abduction whenever she was loose she would rush up to the puppy runs and canter whimperingly around their wire boundaries seeking to attract her little son's attention and always at first sight or sound or scent of her buff would leave his fellow pups and come hurrying to the wire to greet her through the wide meshes their nose would meet in a sniffing kiss and with wagging tails they would stand in apparent converse for minutes at a time it was a pretty sight this greeting and talk between the young aristocrat and his mongrel mother but at shawmere dogs were bred for points and for sale not for sentiment at first buff was wretchedly lonely for nina in the daytime it was not so bad for there was much to amuse and excite him in the populous puppy run but at night when the rest were asleep he missed his mother's warm fur and her loving companionship to some extent his homesickness for her wore off but never entirely always buff sought means to get back to her and their frequent meetings on opposite sides of the wire meshes kept the impulse alive in his heart the run contained a nine pup litter a couple of months older than little buff the biggest pup of the litter on the hour of buff's arrival undertook to teach the lonesome baby his place this he did by falling unexpectedly upon buff as the latter stood disconsolately at the fence looking for his absent mother the bully attacked the small newcomer with much bluster and growling and show of youthful ferocity it was buff's first encounter with the enemy his first hint that the world was not made up wholly of friendliness and it staggered him making no resistance at all he crouched humbly under the fierce attack 
the bully at this sign of humility proceeded to follow up his advantage by digging his milk teeth into buff's soft ear the bite stung and with the sting came a swirl of wholesome indignation into the exiled baby's hitherto peace-loving brain away back in his cosmos snarled the spirit of upstreet butcher boy scarce knowing what he did he flashed from under the larger body and made a lightning lunge for the bully's throat subconscious fighting skill guided the counter assault and lent zest to the grappling youngster's onset as a result some five seconds later the bully was on his back squalling right piteously for mercy from the opponent that had barely two-thirds his size and half his age by this time buff had shifted his vice-like grip from throat to forelegs and thence to stomach for along with the pit terrier's instinct for biting hard and holding on he had inherited his collie forebear's knack of being everywhere at once in a fight and of changing one hold for a better at an instant's notice which unusual combination would have delighted the soul of any professional dog-fighter yet the moment the bully was cowed into subjection buff let him up nor did he at food trough or elsewhere seek to take advantage of his new position as boss of the run he did not care to harass and terrorize lesser pups he preferred to be friends with all the world as he had been with his dear and friendly mother and so time wore on time that shaped the roly-poly buff into a leggy but handsome six months pup and now the promise of the three-day baby was fulfilled more and more every hour with puzzled pride shaw used to stand and inspect him the pup was shaping into a true winner but what could be done with him minus pedigree and plus bar sinister as he was if buff had been a thoroughbred he would have been worth a small fortune to his owner but now again fate settled the problem once and for all it was the night after the kennelman had put collars for the first time on all the pups in buff's yard these collars were of a rudimentary sort and for use only long enough to accustom the young necks to such burden each collar was a circle of clothesline with buckle and a tongue attached and with its wearer's kennel name a very different title from the lofty pedigree name scribbled on a tag attached to the steel tongue buff did not like his collar at all it fidgeted him and made him nervous the name tag flapped tantalizingly just beneath the reach of his jaws which added to the annoyance that was one reason why buff could not sleep after a time he gave up the effort at slumber and came out of the sleeping quarters where his companions were snoozing in furry comfort he made a few futile attempts to get the fluttering tag between his teeth and to rub off the collar against the wire meshes then with a sigh of annoyance he stretched himself out on the ground near the yard's gate he was still lying there when the kennelman came to fill the yard's water pans before going to bed as all the pups presumably were asleep in their houses the man did not bother to shut the wire gate behind him as he entered the yard buff saw the open portal beyond somewhere in the dense darkness were the stables where his mother lived his mother had always been able to solve his few perplexities and soothe his hurts in the days when he still had lived with her doubtless she could help him worry off this miserable collar and tag on the instant the pup trotted out through the swinging gate without so much as a glance at the dimly seen man who was bending over the row of pans and in another second the truant was on the road sniffing to locate the stables but the wind set strong from the opposite direction that night it brought to buff a faint whiff of stables it is true but they were the stables of a farmer a mile down the turnpike now those stable scents had been buff's earliest memory yet he did not know there were any other stables extant besides those in which he had been born so locating the odour he ambled eagerly off down the road in search of his mother perhaps the length of the journey puzzled him but as every step brought the scent stronger he kept on at a bend in the road a half mile below he struck off into the fields and woods taking the shortest cut to the source of the ever increasing odour a furlong from the road his way led through a thick copse into it he galloped merrily in its exact centre 
his run was halted with much abruptness something touched him on the chest and in the same instant tightened painfully about his neck buff snorted with scared anger and lunged forward the thing about his neck promptly cut off his breathing apparatus and dug deep into his soft flesh resisting the panic impulse buff ceased to plunge and roll and sought to find out what had caught him he had run full into the middle of one of several nooses cunningly strung through the copse for foxes twisting his head he seized the noose's taut end between his jaws and fell to gnawing but he had his labor for his pains the thin rope was braided with strands of copper wire against just such a move on the part of some fox at gray dawn the hired man of the farm toward which buff had been faring came out to look at his traps all the nooses but one hung limp in one writhed and struggled a very tired little collie at sight of the farmhand buff stopped struggling and wagged his tail all humans so far as he knew were friendly to dogs here presumably was a rescuer and buff greeted him with warm cordiality the man stood gaping at him for a space then a slow grin began to crease his leathery mouth this was no fox he had caught but it was something that might well prove as valuable he knew shawmere and had often seen the shawmere collies he had heard that the shawmere pups brought big prices here evidently was one of those pups a shawmere collie that had strayed in the night and had been noosed by taking the dog back to its home he might perhaps annex a five dollar reward but scarcely more there seemed better ways of capitalizing his treasure trove paying no heed to buff's friendly advances the man left him there hurried home received grudging permission for a half day off to visit the dentist in town and presently returned to the copse with a pig crate over his shoulder. End of section one.